everyone for attending. Um, we're going to talk about reproducible and immutable uh, OS images with Nix, like building, repro reproducibly building um, OS images for immutable systems with Nix OS. So first a little introduction of mine. My name is Moritz, uh, Moritz Sanft. I'm a security software engineer at Edgeless Systems. Um, I broadly as a company, we work on confidential computing. Um, I personally work mostly on um, virtualization, cloud stuff. Um, I use Nix at home and at work for software builds at work mostly, but um, sorry. Um, also to uh, manage a fleet of devices, mostly at home. Um, and also, of course, NixOS for image builds all the time. Um, yeah. So, agenda for today. Um, I'm first going to motivate the topic a little bit. Um, why, why, is reproducible, why are reproducible builds of OS images important? Why are immutable systems great, um, especially in a, from a security standpoint? Um, we're going to talk about how to actually build OS images reproducibly. Um, shed some light on MCOSI and NixOS, which in my opinion are the two best tools for that. Um, we are then going to like introduce a little um, general framework for how to um, have a have a integrity protected boot chain for immutable systems from which we can then bootstrap trust into the rest of our system. And then at the core of the talk, um, we are going to shed some light on the um, integrations um, NixOS recently has gotten with. System DV part, UKIs, um, DM Verity, which are three core parts of building such images. Yeah, so to motivate the topic a little, um, what are the benefits of immutable systems even? Um, I think immutable systems um, really enable us to, to create integrity protected systems. That's, in my eyes, not really possible with a mutable system. Um, of course, we want to protect against um, people tampering with our file systems while we are not at our machines, while at rest. Um, prevent like evil made type of scenarios. Um, we can achieve that by having read-only file systems. Let that be slash USR, which might be, uh, might be something that most of you have in your distros already. Um, but also like actually having a full read-only root file system which is also possible. Um, and then we can leverage kernel technologies like um, DM Verity to integrity protect our whole OS. Um, but we, we're going to cover that in a little more detail later. And another nice benefit of, of having a read-only file system in, in some part of our system is that we minimize the actual writable space in our OS, which also, to me, means minimizing the space in the OS that's really easily exploitable. Because if you have an arbitrary file write to something and you can override some, some system binary, that's, that's kind of painful. It also gives some, some great, um, great benefits regarding availability. Um, if you have a, like an AB booting scheme and we upgrade our kernel um, and that kernel breaks our system some, somehow, um, we can, in such a scheme, always roll back to a, to a previous generation, um, which should work um, as before. We can do yeah rollbacks, um, but we can also pin down. If we have a, like a transactional update system, we can pin down failures in our system to the specific package updates that introduce the breakage. Right. So if, if like some audio stuff breaks and we see oh I upgraded Pulse Audio like two weeks ago. That might be the culprit. Um, I can, if I have a transactional scheme, I can roll that back as well, um, or should be able to. Um, that's kind of it for immutable systems. Like there are more benefits to immutable systems, but these are the ones that we are we are, will focus on here. Um, now to reproducible builds. Um, and when I say reproducible builds in this talk, I mean like bit by bit reproducibility, because that's actually important for stories like measured boot. Um, you'll always want to have bit by bit reproducibility so that hashes actually match up in the end and nothing like uh, Docker reproducibility where you yeah, should get a thing that works almost the same but it might not be the same, might not be the same content. 
right? Um, I think fundamentally, um, reproducible builds are better than um, having like stuff like build provenance, where you, where you sign your build artifacts, because if you if you publish your source code and people can build that themselves and verify that the output is the same than that than the thing that you publish somewhere. I think that gives you everything that build provenance gives you because you inherently also if you know if you if you, if you have the source you I mean you can you can verify it right because if you have a like if you have a signing scheme where someone signs their container images or whatever you you have to trust them to write you have to trust their key and then you have to also put trust in them to not sign malicious things right and what to do if the key gets compromised and they don't take notice, so can't re can't really do anything there. And um, when you can publish source code and rebuild that, I think that's worth much more. And this especially sh shines in like measured boot schemes, having a verifiable system where we where we can leverage like technologies like TPMs and um, uh, confidential computing technology to then verify in a running system that we actually booted the exact same thing. If you have a bit by bit reproducible thing. We can pre-calculate our own golden measurements for that thing that the TPM PCRs should have when we boot the image, and then when we boot the image, we can tell the TPM, "Hey, give me the PCRs," and verify that it's actually the exact same thing in the running system. Um, I think that's a huge benefit of measured boot with reproducible builds in the kind of marriage, right? And there's also some unrelated um, benefits of. Uh, OS images as a whole. If we have tailor-made, like um, purpose-built OS images for a very specific use case, these have no unnecessary contents. Like you would find a Fedora ISO, maybe there's like 80% of stuff you never need. Um, so having a minimal, um, minimal like trusted closure means that yeah, we have a minimal trust boundary uh, of code that we would. Um, need to audit, say, uh, if, we, if we do that. So um, before we come to how to build the actual OS images, let's talk a bit about uh, how to handling them, how to handle them, um, because desktop users uh, with kind of like pet machines and the pet versus cattle uh, uh, analogy, um, they, they always say like configuration is just easier. And that might for, especially like for developer machines, hold true. Um, you can just download a Fedora ISO, uh, configure, install etc um, so why would these use images um, there's I, I can't really convince them because in most cases I think if you're like a developer user um, having a non image based machine all, all, always makes like more sense if you can install packages uh, as you go um, but maybe for your grandma like if you give your grandma a phone with uh, Linux on it um, you can you don't want her to, to manage her packages uh, on her own, right? Um, and especially on like cattle machines, like servers, um, I think uh, images are always the better choice because you have like easy distribution channels to get the images to the machine. Don't have to flash it on stick, walk up to the machine, stick it into there. Um, but you can use like BMC or cloud provider um, image galleries to get the images there. And um, also for embedded devices, images are kind of like the standard thing, right? Where you build your Yocto thing and then flash it on the on the chip. You have a not much storage, um, yeah. And I think uh, purpose-built images definitely have their use cases with them. But now, like the question is how to build them and how to do so reproducibly um, specifically. Um, one option is MKOSI. It's a systemd ecosystem project. Um, it stands for making OS images. It's great. It's distro agnostic. Lets you build Fedora images, Arch images, Ubuntu images, SUSE images, whatnot. Um, it has a great integration with the other parts of the systemd ecosystem, like Repart, UKFI, Repart for packing the image, UKFI for building UKIs. But it has some kind of uh, critical reproducibility shortcomings to me, even though it does a really great effort to be as reproducible as possible, as reproducible as possible, um, it's kind of hard to use it to build bit by bit reproducible images, because by default, what it does is it uses your host tool chains. So for example, if it wants to pack the image with repart, it yeah, will try to find the repart binary on your host. And then if you want to replicate a um, 
uh, a build artifact from from another machine that's not really possible if you have like a one guy with system d 250 and one with system d 256 um there's probably going to be some differences in how to how the image build with report turns out right um there's an there's this thing to handle that called tools tree where you will build an intermediate image with mkosi to just to source the tools from from that distribution then so if i want to build a fedora image i could first build an intermediate fedora image to source the tools via dnf that i need to build the, the final image but there is no concept of package manager log files in a, in a unified way so you can't just tell um DNF to always get me this version of a package because their mirrors don't even have all the versions of the packages. Um, and so you can't really realize pinning without like hosting your own registry and keeping things locked to a specific version there and then letting MKOSI source the tools from there. Um, there's, a, um, there's a repository called Reproducible MKOSI by our company. Um, there was a talk about it at FOSDEM last year, I think. Um, where we source the tool chains um, via Nix um, for the tools tree for MCOSI, and then we can actually build um, bit by bit reproducible images with MKOSI, um, but only like for for a certain set of distributions. Right now, it's like uh, Ubuntu and Fedora, and it's also um, ki kind of got superseded as Nix now has the functionality to do so as well. But you can check that out if you want to. So. Um, Considering another option to build OS images, NixOS in that case. Um, I mean, who here hasn't heard of Nix before? Never? Okay, there's not a single hand. Like, uh, probably all, all people have heard of Nix uh, some way or the other until now. Um, there's the Nix build system, and NixOS is the Linux distribution built on top of that build system. Um, you would uh, configure your OS in the Nix um, language like consider that example on the right there where you would install some very necessary packages for your system um, and uh, yeah, you just specify that in that functional programming language, um, Nix language. Um, right, and then you can live switch into a configuration generation because <coughs> Nix is a, like a, also has a transactional update scheme where you can roll back into older generations and um, can like go back to any state before before any update, um, right? Um, it's kind of you can consider that OS switching like a more powerful um, RPM OS tree uh, to me and rebooting afterwards. Um, but the great thing about NixOS is that we can now also build uh, OS images from any OS config. So if I have my own OS config for this machine here. I can do some things and then have a bootable image of this exact machine here that I can stuck in somewhere else and like boot that thing, right? Um, that's possible because we had like recent integrations of system D repart, UKIFI, um, and um, especially DM Verity, which I think is a key part for immutable systems. Um, yeah, but we are gonna shed some more light on that uh, in a minute. Um, NixOS is an atomic distro. Um, it has a transactional update scheme. Um, and it's also a mutable distro because in the important you, the, the user is not allowed to, to like write into the thing called the Nix store where the actual software is stored and then linked into your operating system. Um, so it's kind of hard to break things. Um, and I think that's a kind of a good common ground for an OS to, to build mutable um, and like security focused images with. Um, NixOS is great, or like Nix and NixOS are great for reproducibility because they are have hermetic builds. Your builds are very strictly sandboxed and your builds only can, can get stuff that you specified very concisely as um, their inputs. But like, yeah, we now know what Nix is, um, how to actually um, build immutable systems with that now. So next thing we're going to talk about is like a, having a little general, very opinionated framework for how I think such images can, can or should look like. Um, don't be, um, uh, don't fear that complexity of that diagram. Um, we are, we're, going, we're going to explain it. And this really applies not only to, to NixOS, but I think to 
it's a general good scheme for building very simple immutable systems and uh, by protecting the boot chain. And if we protect the boot chain, we can bootstrap trust into our system from there. Because if we can see that our machine has booted the correct things and has the correct files in the system, as we protect the root file system too, um, we can then later on uh, verify the system and establish trust in it as a whole. Um, so then, if we if we have tested the system later on, we can then um, yeah trust it to to provide it with some keys from a KMS or something, right? Um, to me, there are three core components here in, in such a system. That's for one, um, UKIs, uh, which are, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you, you've heard of that uh, throughout the last years a lot. They are that single measurable um, PE binary, which contains all your um, things important for your boot, um, kernel init RD, kernel command line, and um, boot splash and whatnot. There's like nine categories of uh, the, in the UKI spec of things that can go into there. And then um, bootloaders like systemd boot will, will take care of, can, can take care of booting this format, right? Um, exactly. Okay, next component are TPMs and confidential computing, which are like kind of analogous uh, here because like we just need any technology which allows, which is trusted to us and allows us to do like runtime measurements and um, both TPMs through PCRs uh, do that, um, but also like conf newer confidential computing technology, like um, TDX, for example, um, has support for runtime measurements, um, and they pretty much all also have support for T TPMs. Um, we just need uh, something that that has runtime measurement uh, registers and which we where we can merge stuff into, and the option to um, attest the system to verify it later on, and then. To me, the most important, uh, like with UKIs and um, TPMs, we can also protect uh, already protect a fair fair bit of uh, our boot chain. Um, but to me, the core component of this is like um, DM Verity, because with DM Verity, we can protect our root file system as a whole, and or any file system really. Um, it's a it's a method for integrity protection of block volumes, and. How it works is you compute a hash tree for a partition or a volume, um, and then you have a hash for each block and like a hash tree. So each block has a has a single hash in the in the tree, and they all map to a root node called the root hash. And um, that hash tree is then stored like in an auxiliary partition. And if uh, you have the DM uh, uh, DM Verity device mapper uh, module, uh, the kernel can take care of mapping such a pair of partitions, and then upon each read of the data partition, the kernel will actually verify that the hash in the hash tree matches, um, matches what, you, what, what block you read, right? So you, there, no one can actually go and um, yeah, s switch up a, a block in the, um, in the file system because it will mess up the, it, it will have a not matching hash um, and it will mess up the read. Um, there's a root node in the tree, as I said, called the root hash, and because every the root hash actually has the contents of each of the hashes under it uh, in its identity, um, so it authenticates the data partition as a whole. If we know the root hash to match, um, we can this this authenticates our our whole partition, right? And how we can how we can do that, um, how we can embed that into our our system now is um, by using some nice user space glue technologies um, by systemd. Uh, for example, systemd Verity setup generator, but there are also other means like a Verity tab, which is like a table of Verity devices that should be mapped in the kernel, and then it's kind of analog to um, what FS top does, uh, right? And systemd Verity setup generator is nice in the case that it um, can read things of the kernel command line, called, um, root hash and user hash specifically, and I think there's, there are even more uh, things that it recognizes nowadays. Um, but it, the great thing is that it re reads those things off the command line, and um, it then maps the, um, maps the correct devices only based on the hash, because in the discoverable, discoverable partitions um, spec or discoverable disk images spec, um, you, it, it's... Uh, system UV part when building an, an image will actually um, 
put the put the root hash of a variety protected partitions into its um, GPT uh, UIDs, so that uh, other components can then like identify the right uh, partitions only based off that UID. Okay, what gives if we put that in the kernel command line now? For one, um, we we uh, we definitely know that the device is going to be mapped correctly at boot, and then we can just mount dev mapper or whatever um, and have the correct uh, file system in the in the RD. And another really nice or like the core benefit of this putting it in the in the UKI actually is uh, that we have the root hash um, that I authenticates our whole root file system here in case we protect our root file system. This can also be slash USR. Um, putting it into the kernel command line means putting it into the UKI and putting something in the UKI actually always means that we have a um, putting it into a TPM PCR because UKI, every UKI component um, actually will be measured here. Um, and so if we if we have a change in the root hash, that would actually result in a mismatch in the PCR. So we can always notice if someone tampers with that, right? Um, exactly. So we kind of bind the identity of our root file system into the UKI and thus also into our PCR measurements, which we can, as a user, later test uh, the system for. Um, so, so like get a quote of... Uh, what the PCR values are. Okay, now on to the individual components um, of such images. For one, there's UKIs. Um, there's an entry, uh, like specifically in NixOS, um, because that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, there's an entry abstraction in uh, NixOS for UKI since uh, beginning of this year, roughly. Its uh, its implementation was kind of trivial, I think. It was like a 100 or 120 lines change um, um, because uh, the build inputs needed for UKIFI, so that is initrd, kernel, um, kernel command line, and whatnot, boot splash, all these, thi all these things were exposed as um, build targets in the NixOS configuration anyway because, yeah, if you can live build your OS and boot into that, you need to also like build the kernel and build the initrd to later on put it in the ESP and boot from it, right? Um, so for your OS to work, these targets were available anyways, and you just needed to connect the wires correctly to um, to be able to plug that into UKIFI. Um, it's for building images, uh, the use of UKIFI is quite simple. Um, you can simply include a, like a thing called a module um, where you um, yeah, import something uh, from the, from the NixOS tree and then you can just build the UKI target and everything will just work because it will be connected to the exact same things that your OS will uh, would boot into um, otherwise, right? And um, interactive usage of this is a little bit harder. There's a project called Lancer Boot -A, um, which is like secure boot for NixOS. There's a talk on it, I think, at like 3 p.m. or 2 p.m. or something today. And um, it uses something called thin UKIs, um, which is not really a term, but only a term in NixOS, um, for something that looks like a UKI, but uh, doesn't contain a kernel and also doesn't contain an RD, I think. It's really just a command line and some auxiliary uh, stuff, because in NixOS, um, we actually have a, if we, if we would use a full UKI, we'd have a complete UKI for each gener generation. And any time you make like a tiny config change, uh, change your wallpaper or whatever, you'd actually get a complete UKI put into your ESP and that would fill the ESP, which are which is quite small regularly, um, quite fast, right? Um, so they, they have something, uh, some deduplication mechanism there um, to not ship a full UKI on any boot. Um, but it all, Lance Boot also has support for FAT or normal UKIs, which are like the full full UKIs that, that system D stop and system D boot um, also can work with. And as far as I know, uh, as of now, there's like no um, usable thing to, to have UKIs only in NixOS right now, um, because Lanza Boot always gives you this uh, in conjunction with Secure, secure Boot. Um, so I think if some Nix folks are here, I think that would be something that would be nice to do. Uh, like have um, entry support for, for booting off UKIs and live systems. 
So next one is system view report. Um, we have system view report as a repartitioning agent, like its core use in in NixOS for quite a while since like February uh, 2023. Um, image building with it got introduced a little bit later because like system view report can be used as a as the thing that runs on boot and resizes your your partitions, um, but also um, on a on a blank file to to just create a bootable GPT disk image. Um, this enables you to build like a GPT bootable image from any NixOS configuration, um, which was kind of like it was kind of inflexible before. Which we only had like a custom ISO assembler, and then it used Parted to to like format your image into a really static configuration, and you couldn't. Uh, it didn't really allow you to do any more advanced stuff. And Repart gives you that flexibility to to do like just anything you want. Um, you specify your repart configuration in the in the Nix language, which is like a really elegant um, integration. Uh, because, for example, consider the UKI. If you build a UKI build target, that will give you uh, an output object of type path. It will link it to the Nix store path, where where the where the build artifact will uh, will be available. And then the repart builder actually has an abstraction to. Um, like mapping a directory to a to a thing of type path. So, for example, we can map slash uh, in the ESP. We can map like slash EFI slash boot slash boot x64, which is like the, the default location UFI will will look like for uh, look at for a boot target. We can map that to the UKI by uh, just like having string interpolation in that di di dictionary. And the next language allows us to do so by just like putting the build target of the UKI. Into the dictionary uh, value of that that path, and that will then be built automatically as well and included in the in the final image, right? That's something I think that's really great. Like you have also similar things in tools like Bazel, where you can reference outputs of build targets and have that included in in, a, in another target automatically. Um, yeah, so there's no really um, need of manually fitting the things together there, um, like including the UKI and in some like skeleton tree and then including that into the image like Reparch has a thing called copy files where you can just copy a tree into an image but uh, we don't even really need to use that here. Um, so that's for the ESP. Um, in the root partition there will be like all other th things basically. Um, binaries, pre-built configuration stuff, your wallpaper and whatnot, um, man pages, auxiliary uh, files, etc. And with the root partition in the NixOS system, there's a kind of a quirk uh, for uh, if you consider FHS systems otherwise. Um, in a root partition of a NixOS system, there's actually only one path. There's only like slash nix slash store and then uh, content addressable or input addressable paths to to all your uh, to all your things that are inside uh, that. Um, but there's only slash nix slash store. There's no slash bin. There's no slash etc by default. There's only slash nix slash store. And on the ne next slide, that will actually uh, uh, play an important role. Uh, but just remember it for now. And um, how that works is the init RD uh, takes care of mounting and linking the correct uh, stuff around at boot or like at activation time, how, how NixOS calls it. Um, so that's something that you need to work for like enabling live switching into a configuration generation um, because then only certain things need to be linked and uh, mounted and uh, so on. Um, but it's also on first boot um, like to, to be idempotent. Um, right. There are some niceties in, in, in Repart as well. Um, for example, especially like for building immutable images, I think. Um, for example, Repart gives you the option to um, um, add matching variety partitions automatically, and then Repart will actually take care of like building a discoverable disk image, like take care of putting that root hash into the partition UUID, so that uh, other user-based software can then um, identify the partitions just by these uh, UUIDs, right? And then, if you have that um, specified Repart configuration, you just build like that build target system dot build dot image, um, like Nix build system dot build dot image, and then yeah get your disk image for your configuration. So if you just like 
have a laptop and want to build a disk image of your configuration, you can just do that now. But we are also going to cover DM Verity in XOS. Um, it's actually very, very, very recent. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's it's had, it's been uh, merged in three this week. Um, to be fair, you could use Report in XOS. Uh, you could use DM Verity in XOS for a little bit longer. It's just a more usable abstraction now for for doing so. Um, but to to use Report, you uh, to use DM Verity, you really only have to include like some kernel modules and. If you want to use the generators, you, you have to include those targets as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, kind of locked behind a single knob right now, DM Verity enable, and then uh, things just work. Um, it uh, consists of the kernel device mapper uh, and the integrity kernel module, um, and like that user space glue um, I was talking about, like things that read your Verity tab and Verity setup generator, uh, whatever you, you want to use there. Um, just need to be some channel to to read the inputs of which partition to map and where to put it. Um, um, can be anything really. Can also write your own generator. There even this one NixOS for protecting only a Nix store, um, which obviously isn't in the upstream system. The very setup generator. Now back to the quirk we we talked about in the last slide. Um, there's kind of a problem with that only containing the next door thing, um, as DM Verity requires read-only volumes. Um, that's something you always need to consider with DM Verity. Uh, if you need a read-write volume, you'd need to use DM Integrity, which is kind of slow, because it does the integrity at file level, and it also doesn't really give you the <coughs> same, uh, same security guarantees that DM uh, Verity will give you. Um, yeah, so DM Verity is kind of what we want to use, especially in immutable image-based systems. Um, and the problem with that now is that it has some incompatibilities with how NixOS sees its world, where it doesn't really like uh, read-only um, volumes, because those, those things called activation scripts, which take care of that linking and mounting stuff from the, they are contained in image ID and then like are instructed to, to mount paths uh, from the next door, bind mounted in, into other locations, or link uh, your slash etc, for example. And because in the Nix image there's only slash Nix slash store contained, um, there's yeah, it wants to create slash etc, for example, before uh, mounting something from the next door there. Um, it also writes some stops, etc. Um, there are fixes to this problem. Um, we can easily fix it by integrity protecting only slash nix slash store, for example, by using that uh, in-tree NixOS uh, generator um, or out-of-tree NixOS generator, um, which only protects nix store, and then it reads like a thing called store hash from your command line and takes care of mounting slash nix slash store um, only, and especially in conjunction with a thing that comes in the 612 kernel, um, IPE LSM, which only um, allows you to uh, execute binaries from a DM Verity protected volume on your whole system. I think in conjunction with that, it can be a can be a great option. But it also has some like fallacies. So, for example, it doesn't really consider uh, scripting or interpreted stuff um, where we don't have a have an executable binary directly. Um, yeah. So we we want to interpret a less system in that case actually. Um, we can also fix it by uh, using slash usr hash from the variety setup generator and then having our slash nix slash store in slash usr slash nix slash store and then bind mounting that to, to slash nix slash store at boot time um, so that everything uh, else will work. Um, but really the, the long term fix I think is dropping the activation scripts in, uh, in image builds and actually building static OS trees instead um, which would in my opinion, definitely be the way going forward because in an image-based system that you don't want to, to live switch uh, later on, you can really just build a static tree and then go from there. Um, but that's currently not possible due to the limitations of the Nix sandbox. It would need to be tight, uh, loosened a little. Um, yeah, so for now, I just circumvent these issues by mount overlay mounting a writable file system to, while these activation scripts run and uh, re remounting them read-only later on um, so that we have like only during boot we can write some stuff there and 
just let these scripts succeed and then later on we, are, we, are, we should be fine. Um, but generally the, the upstream work has already started to um, drop these activation scripts for image builds as, as they are generally considered like not, not good for, for image-based systems. Um, and, and those, they, they, they should be dropped in those eventually. So yeah, that was it for the NixOS integrations. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, I think to conclude, uh, immutable and reproducible OS images are definitely worth it. Um, if we have measured boot, we always, I think, if you build our OS ourselves, always want to have reproducible builds. It's better than build provenance in my eyes. And currently, to me, NixOS and Nix uh, give you the best tools at hand to, to build such images, um, even if MCOSI does quite an, quite an effort to do so. There's actually an accompanying repository uh, for my talk where I implemented everything um, that I talk about here and like, like have an have a exemplary build target of an immutable NixOS system. You can boot, boot that with QMU. And I would have loved to talk about what to hack on um, regarding the, those uh, systems, um, but time was a little tight here and would have blown up my uh, presentation. So just feel free to contact me via the means there or chat to me at a, at a, a conference um, if, you, if you want to talk about that. I'd love to. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, been happy to be here. For we have four minutes for questions. Hi, uh, do you know if uh, Nix OS support cross architecture builds? I mean, if, yeah, I, it does. Uh, if I would like to build an image for a RISC V. Yeah, you can on, do so. I did that actually. Um, yeah, um, I did that uh, for uh, like a little RISC V um, SOC. Um, you, there's a thing called packages cross where you can like reference a package set for another architecture and then build for that architecture. Um, yeah, so that's possible. Great talk. Quick question. So one thing I didn't understand, could you just step through the mechanics of an OS update a little bit? Like Nix by default does that beautiful thing, right, where the binaries are just a cache of the input, right? Is the client fetching the DM Verity from a remote server? Like, or are, are you relying on the bit for bit reproducibility where the client basically is reassembling that DM Verity image client side from like remote inputs. Do you know what I mean? So for um, you'd have to build some scaffolding around to to use DM Verity in a live system because you'd you'd have to put build a whole image and put it into a into another partition and then boot from there. I think or like you have to you have to do some juggling with the partitions to have your next root partition elsewhere or next next door partition elsewhere and then use that. But um, like if you use the repart builder, you can you have the the build result of your partition. And you build it locally, and you then also have like a local copy of the of the hash of that partition because repart calculates it, right? Did that answer the question, or okay? Yeah, let's talk about it later if you if you feel. So one minute left. Any other question? Yes. What if the root hash in the UKI doesn't match? What does DM Verity do then? Yeah, so it, 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 system D, uh, the, the generator wouldn't mount it because it wouldn't find a, find a matching partition and you wouldn't trust the system because your PCR values would have changed, right? So does it fall back to like another Does it fall back to an, a previous immutable? Uh, I mean, you could, you could build that, but I think if, you're, if your root hash suddenly changed it and won't. it doesn't match, you, you, you wouldn't want to, right? Understood. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that is all. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>